Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. By the way, be sure to join us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash UNC knowledge. Facebook.com forward slash unc knowledge. Mitchell Elias Daniels Jr. is the 49th governor of Indiana. A graduate of North Central High School in Indianapolis, of Princeton University, and of the Georgetown Law School, Mr. Daniels served as an assistant to mayor of Indianapolis and then United States Senator Richard Lugar. In the Reagan White House, where we met, Mr. Daniels served as political liaison to the president. In the George W. Bush White House, Mr. Daniels served for two years as director of the Office of Management and Budget. Mr. Daniels was elected governor of Indiana in 2004 and then re-elected in 2008. In both campaigns, he crisscrossed the state, riding in an RV or on a Harley Davidson and visiting every one of Indiana's 92 counties at least three times. Re-elected in 2008, he won more votes than any other candidate in the history of Indiana. Mitch, what model Harley? Well, there are two. Oh, you've got two? Yeah. Yeah, there's, a, there's an 04 uh, low rider, it's called, which is now painted to look like the state flag. <laughs> sort of the official uh, uh, bike of the state. And then uh, there's a, a black 2008 uh, fat boy. Good, good. You live well. Set the weekend edition of the Wall Street Journal. Mm -hmm. Front page. The governor who cut his state down to size. Mr. Daniels cut spending, trimmed the state workforce to its smallest in decades, and turned a yawning deficit into a surplus mm. with only scattered outbursts of popular anger along the way. He has emerged from all this with high marks from voters. How'd you do it? I was very mysterious. Um, I hate to give away secrets, you know, but for you I will. Uh, we spent less money than we took in. It's an old, uh, I somewhere said, tribal ritual out in Indiana. Not to be too flip about it, it wasn't that uh, easy. We did have an extraordinarily uh, tight, tightest state budget in 55 years. Uh, spending uh, for the six years that we've been uh, on the job in Indiana is the lowest, I think, in the country. The spending growth, that is, less than 1%, which is about one-third the rate of inflation. So we just put the brakes on spending very, very hard. And you had, in Indiana, the legislature is called the General Assembly. Right. You've got two houses, but together they're called the General Assembly. That's right. You had Republican majorities in Four years of your six, is for, that correct? Well, not yet. No. The first two, and then for the last uh, month, we've had that again. But for the intervening four years, it was a divided legislature, which the, our Democratic friends were in charge of the House. Another in indispensable tool, Peter, was that the legislature, uh, whether uh, Republican or divided, was kind enough to uh, delegate to the uh, to the governor. Uh, the opportunity to reduce spending uh, if revenues uh, disappointed, which they did in a huge way. And we've used that authority really vigorously. Essentially an impoundment authority or it a decision is, yeah. authority? Which, incidentally, I, I've argued would be something that would be useful to restore. It, presidents of the United States once had such an authority. And I think if we're ever going to get that squared away, it would be a very nice uh, implement for their toolbox. But anyway, it was, uh, between... Um, uh, a very successful, I would say, cooperation on, on the budgets we got, and then aggressive action every single day to look for ways to stretch dollars and, and spend even fewer than they voted for. Uh, we got out of bankruptcy into a strong enough position to ride through the recent uh, difficulty without a tax increase. We're basically the only state not sitting on a lot of oil, gas, or something energy related to have done that. And, um, Music to the ears of a Californian, where we're facing $29 billion deficit over two years. You cut property taxes, mm -hmm. but raised sales taxes. Why do you prefer property taxes to sales taxes? I mean, why, why do you prefer keeping those low? Well, we thought we were out of balance. We thought our property tax system was um, uh, working a hardship on homeowners, on senior citizens, and even on our business sector. And it was growing very fast. And uh, so... Um, uh, it's important to know this was the biggest tax cut in state history. So the revenue that a penny of, of sales tax raised was offset almost two to one by the cuts in property taxes. And on top of that, we capped property taxes, and now we've made this constitutional. So uh, just to eat your California heart out, if you came to Indiana, as you ought to do really, 
and uh, bought a house, it would not only cost you a lot less, you would never pay more than one cent on the dollar of market value maximum uh, uh, to own that home in property taxes. Education. Andy Ferguson in his weekly standard cover story about you appeared this past summer, quote, school funding increased, increased. You've been talking about everything you've cut. School funding increased every year under Daniels before the recession and since the downturn, when most areas of state government have seen cuts of 25 percent or more, education has been reduced by two percent. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, uh, it's unknown to most uh, Hoosiers and unfortunately I think to most Indiana educators, but um, uh, we looked recently and Indiana by a clear margin devotes a higher percentage of its state government, over 50 percent, to K-12 than any other state in the Union. So we have protected uh, education funding about as well as I think we could could have. You're not opposed to government. You believe there are certain essential functions and in the state, in state governments, education is the primary function. Public safety is probably the primary function, All but right. right behind it. Um, yes, um, uh, we think public education. Now that's a function uh, which leads to a different set of arguments. The, the function is to see that the children are educated. You know, how we do that um, is, is something honest people can differ about. The function is not to create a system, however, which I think over the years some people have, have confused means with ends. Mm -hmm. um, uh, briefly, while we're still talking about your uh, time as governor, you've got a couple of measures pending before the General mm -hmm. Assembly right now, which I'd like to touch on just briefly. Um, quoting a speech you gave earlier this month, before our current legislature adjourns, we intend to become the first state of full and true school choice. Yes. Uh, We've already achieved a situation in which um, any uh, family that, that can, can manage it can enroll their child in a different public school district, cross a, um, district lines, no tuition. Um, when you say they can manage it, they, they're going to have to drive the child back? They might. Okay. They might. Right. Uh, and during this General Assembly, we were trying to dramatically expand charter schools, which is another very important form of choice. And then finally, for low and moderate income families who still can't, aren't confident they found the right uh, uh, of a public option, either traditional or charter, um, a, a scholarship that they can uh, take to the non-government school that they prefer. You're not using the word voucher. I could. That's a common term for it. That's what it is. But um, uh, you know, I prefer to think of it as as a scholarship that right. the uh, the money really is for the child and for the child's education. Is the point I was referring to earlier. The responsibility of the state is is to try to make certain that every child can have a high quality education, but we trust families to decide for themselves where uh, that can best be achieved for their child. Last item while we're talking about your time as governor, <clears throat> again quoting from the speech you gave in February, my proposal for, an, uh, again pending before your general, current General Assembly, my proposal for an automatic refund of tax dollars beyond a specified level of state reserves. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> in a way you can think of this as a uh, uh, a very flexible spending limitation, but the idea simply is that we would decide uh, when, ba when budgets are balanced and a sufficient uh, savings account has been set aside, and that, I'm open to what that is. Is it 10% of the year's budget? Is it 12? But uh, beyond some point that we'd agree on, uh, automatically any revenues uh, left over beyond that would go back uh, to the taxpayer. I think it would uh, create a healthy incentive for future legislators to stop spending mm. uh, at some point so they could uh, um, give at least a small uh, refund to everybody. Um, <clears throat> segment two, the red menace. The governor of Indiana speaking in February to the Conservative mm -hmm. Political Action Committee, conference rather, Conservative Political Action Conference, quote, the American project is menaced by a survival level threat. We face an enemy lethal to liberty and even more implacable than those America has faced before. We cannot deter it. We cannot negotiate with it. It is the new red menace. Well, maybe it's overheated, uh, but and I hope, by the way, that I'm wrong. I hope well, the point is exaggerated. Whatever it is, you got the nation's attention. The press uh, really responded. I keep hoping that someone that wise will come up and say, now Mitch, wait a minute, you've overlooked this or this or this. This is this, this problem of debts piling up to levels, the sort of grease-like levels or um, in, in, in prospect out there, uh, is, is uh, nothing to worry about. It's going to work out for the following reasons. 
I haven't found that person yet. You know, Peter, my view is, and I, I think I said it in that talk, I, I've said it frequently, this is not, to me at bottom, a philosophical argument. Um, it's an arithmetic one. And so I say to people who, uh, who believe in a lot bigger government, more intrusive government that, than I do, let's have that debate tomorrow. For tonight, can we agree that the mathematics does not work here? Mm. The, the machine will go tilt and we'll all pay a terrible price, regardless of our... Can I, what, when you say, so yeah. here's what's in my back of my mind. Back of my mind is George W. Bush, you were back home in Indiana by this point, but George W. Bush devoted more or less the first 18 months, almost two years of his second term, to talking about the danger of Social Security going bankrupt. It was going to go bankrupt in some X number of years out, and he got nowhere. Yeah. And so, as a layman watching all this happen, I assume that one reason he got nowhere was that it did, did all seem so far out and so <laughs> abstract. How do you make concrete to people what's going to happen? You talk about a survival level threat. Yeah. What actually will go wrong? And when will it start to go wrong? When will we feel it? Uh, it well, it could happen gradually, but it also uh, could happen in, uh, all at once and, and, and fairly soon. There's a great little line from Hemingway that people have been exhuming lately where the characters ask, how'd you go broke? And he said two ways, uh, gradually and all at once. <laughs> um, and um, um, you can't exclude, I, I hope this is remote, but you can't exclude that there'd be a sudden run on the dollar, loss of confidence, a la Lehman Brothers, for instance. Right. And in a wired world, this thing could happen very, very you could have quickly. A, you could have a meltdown that would make the meltdown of 2008 look minor. Sure. And, uh, but let's just exclude that for a moment. All right. It is... There, uh, I don't know at this point of, of anybody, regardless, again, their view of uh, 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 political philosophy, who believes that you can run any enterprise, private, public, small, large, with the kind of debt levels that we are abs we're headed for with absolute certainty. Sooner or later, your creditors run you. Mm. And so, uh, and, and uh, there's all sorts of evidence that we'll have a permanently stunted economy, that the American dream of upward mobility, uh, of, of one's children doing better than, than you did, will perish. And uh, that'll lead, I think, to a loss of liberty. It'll certainly lead to a loss of influence in the world. It'll lead to, a much, uh, to much less uh, national security than we probably really want to have. And so I think it's a problem we all share, whatever our differences on other questions. Um, and I'm again, I, I'm waiting, uh, uh, hopefully, for someone to uh, tell me to calm down. And, uh, not as bad as I think. Uh, so unemployment in Spain right now, 20%. Yeah. One in five workers yeah. looking for a job can't get one. In Ireland, it's moving up in that direction. In Greece, the numbers are unreliable, but something like that, if not worse. That could happen here. I don't know how it doesn't happen if we wind up where those countries uh, did in terms of the money they owe. Uh, uh, so much of, uh, of the entire substance of the economy going just to pay the interest on the right. bills you ran up uh, in the past. So. Okay. Let me quote you again, Mitch. Again, this is your CPAC speech. We know that the basic element, we know what the basic elements of reform must be. Sunsetting the major welfare programs of the last century when those currently soon to be enrolled currently or soon to be enrolled, have passed from the scene, the creation of a new Social Security and Medicare compacts with the young. Sunsetting Social Security, the revered program, seven decades old, given to us by the great father of us all, Franklin Delano Rosa. Mm -hmm. You haven't just touched the third rail of American politics. You have given it a body hug. Well, uh, look, first of all, um, uh, I, I chose that word uh, carefully. It, mean, it, it doesn't, for a moment, disparage the system we've had to say that uh, it may have worked great for uh, a long, long time, but uh, it may not work well going forward. You know, you asked me earlier, why should we believe that uh, any of these things can occur? Um, I'll give you some reasons for optimism. One of them is that dividing the programs, whether it's Social Security or Medicare, saying to those who are counting on them now or will in 10 years or 15 years, don't worry about a thing. A deal is a deal, you're good to go, that you're gonna have exactly the program that you expected. But you say to the young people who are getting the massive shaft in this country the way we're headed right now, uh, they are paying for today's retirees, some people haven't caught on to that yet, but they are, 
uh, the today's workers pay for yesterday's workers. Right. And um, and uh, they have no prospect at present of anything remotely equivalent waiting for them when they get to their elderly years. So here's the reason for optimism. You know, tens of millions of Americans have been through this already. Business after business uh, uh, over the last 10 or 20 years has uh, come to the conclusion that the existing pension system or the existing uh, health care system that they had, health insurance system, um, was going bust. And so they, they, can, they left it in place for those past a certain point, but right. they started a new plan. It's not radical. Uh, what would be radical and tragic would be to just leave this thing on autopilot, take everybody off a cliff. Speech to CPAC again. You proposed a couple of good ideas. You quoted them as, as good ideas. One would be a new tax system. Again, to quote you, lower and flatter and completely flat is best. Now, you know politics as well as anybody, so I don't really re need to remind you, but I will, that when Jerry Brown ran for the Democratic presidential nomination against Bill Clinton on a flat tax, he got wiped out. <clears throat> and when Steve Forbes ran for the GOP nomination on a flat tax, he registered 2 and 3% in polls with a margin error of 3 or 4%. Got nowhere. So you are arguing, is this, I'm probing here, I just want to know what's, are you saying here's something toward which we should aim as an ultimate idea, the way Milton Friedman would just say, I look, I know this isn't practical, but someday maybe, or are you saying circumstances have changed, there's an opening? Yeah. Well, this is interesting. Um, first of all, uh, let me, I'm going to back up a half step and sure. catch up quickly. <laughs> circumstances. Uh, I believe have changed. People, uh, let's go back to the debt issue. And could, could you really talk about changing the um, so-called entitlement right. program? The third rail. Um, uh, why now? Why when? You know, President George, George Bush, Bush got nowhere. Right. Right. Um, well, uh, one reason might be that we've had this little intervening event, a terrifying recession, associated with debt, and everybody knows it, and almost every American either had a personal up close and personal encounter with debt or their family member did or their neighbor did or the business they were in did and I think you will have a permanent change in outlook from folks who have looked in the mirror and thought to themselves you know grandpa was on to something right when he said don't borrow too much so now let me switch back to the uh, simpler lower flatter tax right you know, there also uh, this one I think is a whole lot easier, and I, and you'll remember, I spent a great deal of my time in the uh, our, my service to President Reagan out advocating lower, flatter taxes. They, we, uh, you know, the rates came way down, and we got to the them. The eighty-six reform worked. That's it did right. happen. Yes, that's right. And um, I'll also mention that uh, this is one item on which I think economists across the spectrum, right to left, seem to agree that a more neutral system is, not, is first of all, more fair, but the most important thing, and the reason it was in that speech is, if we, don't, we can do all the reforming that, that I might dream about, we can cut the federal government down in, in all the ways that we, that we should, um, but if this economy does not grow no at, a, at a very rapid rate, and for years, without much of a hiccup, we just cannot catch up to the, the debts that we've piled up. And that's the main reason. And I think if you argued it to Americans, first on the basis that it would be simpler, a lot of us could resume paying our own taxes again, which only a minority, what an, what an embarrassment that in our society, a dwindling minority of people can cope with the voluntary tax system. Not only be uh, better in that respect, but that the main point would be more jobs and more hope going forward, and every economist around agrees with that, you might have a chance. Okay. So the answer is you are serious. You're serious. You want to get this stuff done now. Well, we'll, well come to that. We'll come to that. Did, did I act like I was no. joking? <laughs> uh, <laughs> segment three, what does he mean by that? You spoke at CPAC, Conservative Political Action Conference, in February. Chris Wallace just today called you the it boy. David Brooks has said you ought to run. George Will said you have the low-key charisma of competence. I love that phrase. Um, front page, here we are, of the Wall Street Journal, this weekend edition. And so your old friend Robinson's been looking around the conservative web, and people are 
more than interested. But there are a few questions. So let me put them to you, yeah. give you a chance to answer questions folks are raising. Value added tax. At CPAC in February, you advocate a flat tax, but when you spoke at the Hudson Institute in October, you quoted Hudson's founder, the remarkable intellect, a great man in my judgment, Herman Kahn, who said, this is you quoting Herman Kahn, yeah. quote, it would be most useful to redesign the tax system to discourage consumption and encourage savings and investment. One obvious possibility is a value added tax and flat income tax. Close quote. And then you added, this is your words, that might suit our current situation pretty well. Yeah. Close quote. Well, you know, I'm not for a VAT tax. I, um, I was extemporizing that night. I was making really two points. That the, um, the Hudson Institute I knew and, and loved was really famous for its contrarian thinking. And it, it, it operated on the premise that by the time everybody agrees on something, it's probably wrong. And let's go figure out why. <laughs> And I, and I was really commending the fact that way back then, he was talking about getting away, you know, down to something much flatter on the income tax, taxing consumption as opposed to work and investment and so forth. This is vintage Ronald Reagan, by right. the way. Right, it sure and is. And so, you know, I probably, trying to make that point, left an impression, I think the VAT tax is a good idea. I don't. It's unambiguous. Uh, you are not in favor no, of no, flat tax. No, of course not. Okay. Now, you know, but let me just point out sure. that a, a very flat Income tax, the kind I described in that right. speech. I specifically mentioned, let's don't tax investment and um, so forth. But if you do that, it works out pretty much like a consumption tax. Right, right. Uh, just, you, just, you, just, you just call it something different. But the whole point uh, uh, I, it was to, to say that uh, on that one evening, you know, let's keep thinking. Let's keep our brains turned on. Let's see if there are some new ideas regardless of the subject matter. And um, that's all I had in mind. Okay, collective bargaining. On your first day as governor, you reversed an executive order that a Democratic predecessor had signed granting collective bargaining rights to state employees. That happened six years ago. It happened. You're on the record. And then in February, you opposed a right-to-work measure mm -hmm. that your own folks, your, the Republicans in your own legislature, were advocating. And Boy, was there consternation on conservative websites. Uh, what does Governor Daniels think he's doing? Yeah. Well, the better question is what the right to work people think they were doing. <laughs> All right. You know, I don't, I don't necessarily pose a right to work bill. In fact, I've said, oh, I've been saying for years that this is something Indiana needs to look at. It does cost us jobs. We've been doing very, very well, but we. Uh, uh, because people can set up shop in Mississippi or South Carolina. Well, here's, where here's an example. If you, if you, we have been working relentlessly to make our state a more pro-growth, pro-business place. And we've come to the top of everybody's ranking. Go look at any of them, Forbes, right. Fortune, Site Selection Magazine, whatever it is. And uh, uh, the one uh, box we cannot check is the right to work box. When we get a competitive opportunity, when we're aware of a business who is looking around for a place to invest, and we get a, a chance to show them Indiana, our, our success record for six years is 90%. But we also know that there's about a quarter of the opportunities that won't look at us for this one reason. So I have been uh, openly you know, said that this is a legitimate stu uh, subject. But here's the problem. Um, we worked very hard with an, with an open and explicit agenda of, you would have to say, conservative change. And uh, won an election. And I've been very excited about advancing, about achieving these things. Some we've talked about here, the automatic refund to taxpayers. Right. Uh, school uh, choice. The biggest uh, school choice opportunity in America, cutting the corporate income tax rate to bring in more jobs, um, a sweeping reform of criminal justice and local government and so forth. Into this very uh, uh, packed and sometimes controversial picture came, came the idea out of nowhere of a right to work bill. No one had campaigned on it, not the, not the legislators who brought it in. They had not gone to their people of their districts or the state and said, this is what we should do and why. And I said, why don't you bide your time? There's a better way, develop the case, and maybe next year. Uh, I was very afraid tactically of exactly what happened. This provided the pretext for our uh, Democrats to uh, repair to a hot tub in Illinois they pulled, Where, the, as, pulled as, the Wisconsin. They hit. They skedaddled from the whole state. That's right. And uh, 
that entire agenda, which these critics you're talking about, if they were aware of it, I think they'd probably be enthusiastic about everything we were on the brink of doing. Right to work never had a chance. It probably has, by the way, their chances in Indiana have probably been reduced right. by the sudden you know, surprise uh, move that they made. And in the meantime, they have jeopardized one of the most uh, ambitious, it's fair to say, conservative agendas in the country. So it was a terrible, at best, it was a terrible bit of judgment on the part of those who plowed ahead anyway. Okay. Segment four, what does he mean by that continued? <clears throat> the truce. Last summer, you told Andy Ferguson, doing a profile for you for the Weekly Standard, quote, the next president would have to call a truce on the so-called social issues, close quote. Now let me read to you a couple of sentences from Bill McGurn, Wall Street Journal columnist, friend. Quote, the aggression on social issues today emanates mostly from the left, whose preferred vehicle is a willing judge inflicting his private social preferences on the law. Anyone who believes a Republican call for a truce will end this is living in a dreamland. A far better way to unite Republicans and independents and Tea Partiers would be to talk about returning these hot button issues to where they belong, the states and the localities acting through the people's elected governors and legislators. Close quote. You got Bill McGurn angry, that's for sure. Well, he may be right. I don't want to argue with anybody about this. You know, one of the ironies is, um, you look at what I've said, and in, in, in my case, done. Um, I'm in complete agreement with most of those who... Well, let's talk about that. You have a pro-life record. Yeah, and unlike a lot of people, I've just talked about it. We have actually passed legislation to, in essence, make it more informed. The choice that the law currently requires more informed in Indiana. Um, abortion clinics were not regulated till I ordered it uh, in Indiana. And so uh, we've taken uh, those steps. You don't, have, don't take it from me. You can check with the right. right to life organizations. They've never had, they will tell you, uh, a governor so pro-life. Um, so it's not that I disagree at all about with, with these folks, and I don't want to have an argument about it. Bill may well be right. Um, it was simply a, a tactical suggestion that goes back to the premise we discussed earlier. If you, if you don't believe that the American Republic is mortally threatened, as I do, by this one overriding problem we have built for ourselves, then of course I'm wrong. And, uh, uh, but if that is the case, then all I was really saying was, I don't want to lose one person. You, were you keep talking about yeah. how hard it's going to be, and it is, to make the kind of changes that will restore America's greatness. And uh, all I was saying was, we're going to need to unify all kinds of people. And we're going to need, freedom is going to need every friend it can get if we're going to do these things. And so, that's, you know, but look, the folks who have taken exception. Uh, they're your friend. They're your, they're, and, I'm, and I'm theirs, and I respect them. And, uh, right, so let me, let me ask one more question on this truce idea. Because this, again, is everybody, this is everywhere. So let's give you a chance just to address it. The next president, whoever that might be, is very likely to face a, an appointment, a vacancy on the Supreme Court. Now, if that next president were following your advice, wouldn't make a bit of difference. Has nothing to do with that. There well, is, in other words, does a truce mean that you you let Cass Sunstein and Larry Tribe give you the, I mean, or no. you choose somebody from the federal society? What what the heck does a truce mean? Well, in that if case? I'm the one who used the word, am I entitled to decide what I was talking sure about? Sure, you are. Yes, yeah. yes. Well, first of all, it was addressed to both sides. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. McGurn was quite right. I've said the same thing many times. The most the aggression right now comes from those who are trying to, you know, change. Uh, uh, our social uh, arrangements uh, by judicially or somewhere uh, uh, from the other side. But um, this has nothing to do with one of the s deepest uh, convictions that I have is about strict construction of constitutions. It goes to the heart of our rule of law. I've only had three shots to appoint judges in Indiana. Um, we have one of those systems in which I am sent a panel and I have appointees to the panel so they know what I'm looking for. And fortunately, I've always had the opportunity so far. I've selected three of the most rock-ribbed, unimpeachably strict constructionist judges Indiana has seen. That's, abs that's a non-negotiable uh, item uh, with me. And I hope, you know, that next president, whoever 
that may be, All right. we'll have that same viewpoint. Defense. Two quotations. One, you at CPAC, quote, nothing, not even our national defense can get a free pass. We are constantly, we are currently borrowing the entire defense budget from foreign investors. That is not, as our military friends say, quote, a robust strategy, close quote. Item two, this is almost a dirty trick because I know you, you and I feel the same way about him. Quotation two, Ronald Reagan, mm -hmm. quote, defense is not a budget issue. You spend what you need. Well, if you have it, <laughs> you know, if you have it, uh, I said in the very same speech, I've served in two administrations that practiced peace, the policy of peace through strength. It is, I think, inarguable historically that it worked. Right. And it was the appropriate policy, and it always will be. But um, we have not been in this bind before. You know, we have not been as broke as we are or are about to be. And it is absolutely inevitable if we do not tackle the uh, deficit and debt problems, defense will get strangled anyway. I said we'll have, if we don't get on top of this, we'll have a lot less strength and eventually we may not have peace. All right. Um, fighting war in Afghanistan, much of the Middle East aflame, China expanding its military dramatically. Let me quote to you Hillsdale political scientist and Ricochet mm -hmm. contributor Paul Ray. Uh, our fiscal crisis is not the only particular we must address. The Chinese are behaving like bullies. I also believe we're witness witnessing a strategic shift in the Mediterranean. The younger generation is turning to the only cultural force that has purchase in the post-Cold War world. They are turning to Islam. Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, Jordan, Bahrain, these states are likely to become more hostile to us. What does Mitch Daniels know about any of this? We have no indication. Close quote. Yeah. Well, um, I'm not uh, utterly new or naive to these things. The work of Hudson Institute was all about national security. And as OMB director, didn't you see, you had all a seat that, on the National Security Council? Yes, yes, in fact. And Senator Luger, in the years I worked for him, um, uh, was on the Foreign Relations Committee. So, um, so that's I don't want to overclaim, but it's not as though I've not paid attention. You know, as as a lot of folks do, Peter, you left out of your the introduction the 15 most important years of my life, my years in business, which included going all over the world uh, on behalf of, uh, of one company, uh, actually two, and um, uh, you know, seeing a lot of things uh, uh, in, in a way that you may not get uh, sitting on a college campus, uh, you know, reading uh, people's journal, uh, reading uh, l learned journals. So um, I'm not going to have a credentials argument here, but I'll, I will just say this, that, that once again, if we are not, if we do not restore the vitality of the American economy. If we do not, in the process, get on top of our debt so that we are not the beggars of the world, um, you know, the professor there, he won't have an answer either as to what you do about the Mediterranean or the Chinese. Chinese won't have to threaten us militarily. They just call the, they just call the bonds. All right, segment five, final segment. The man on the Harley. You've worked for two presidents, Ronald Reagan and George W. Bush. You're a student of American history. Who are your heroes? In American history, who are your heroes? Oh, so I can't start with Duke Snyder. Huh? <laughs> I yeah. wanted to cut that one off right away. Yeah. Washington. Um, and uh, in American history, Washington. And um, this one uh, will surprise you because it surprised me. Uh, U.S. Uh, Grant. Wouldn't have told you that till a few years ago, but I've been reading a lot more about him. And, he was underestimated uh, both as a, a general and, uh, and as a man. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt with qualifications. Uh, so, uh, and, Eisenhower, you, and Eisenhower. And Eisenhower. Eisenhower for sure. Okay, you just named three, four tough hombres. I'm trying to find the theme here. You just named four men's <laughs> men, strong <laughs> figures, figures of action, people who got things done. Have I identified the, the theme there? Yeah, well, how many people you do you have? You look accomplishment. How many people you know have weenies for heroes? I mean, yeah, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, David Brooks in the New York Times. In early February, Governor Mitch Daniels of Indiana met with a group of college students. He told them there is an excellent chance he will not run for president. This is the GOP mm -hmm. quandary. The man who would be the party's strongest candidate for the presidency is seriously thinking about not running. 
Daniels and Obama could have a great and clarifying debate. What exactly are the paramount problems facing the country? What is the government's role in solving them? I, says David Brooks, hope Daniels gives us a chance to be part of that. Close quote. Well, how are you going to decide? First, you need to know that um, I visited with those students because um, none of whom I'd ever met. Uh, they somehow spontaneously had gotten together in the uh, social media way people do now and on 50-some campuses had these organizations asking me to Oh, do really? This. Yes. And so I found out that a large number of them were going to be at that place where I gave the speech, and I didn't want to come and go without thanking them. I'll tell you what I told them. I did say that, you know, I, as I've said to many others, I've, I've not decided uh, not to do this, but I certainly have not decided to uh, run for office, I, per, national office, had never really thought about that till recently. What I wanted them to, what I wanted them to know is how much I appreciated, first of all, their, their confidence, and that I urged them, in the event I didn't run, I said, you've got to rebrand and keep moving forward. It's the young people of America whose interests are most threatened by the mistakes that we continue to make or the problems we continue not to address. And so uh, that, that's why I was, was visiting with them and, and gave them an honest assessment. Yeah, very well may not. You know, Peter, I, uh, we go back. And I can't, I, I, to, to, could I just back? We do go back. So um, there you were, president of North, North American Operations at Eli Lilly, one of the finest companies, best places to work, most admired corporations year after year after year. <laughs> Lilly ranks right up there. You had a huge job, 30,000 people overseeing them, or operations on an entire continent. You were making very good money. Forget about running for president. I don't understand why you stepped down to run for governor. Well, of course I didn't. I got a phone call and then another and asked me to come into the uh, Bush 43 administration. Right. And, um, but you, well, you could have gone back to Lilly or, go ahead. Well, I, and that's what I thought I'd do. Life led in a different way. But even after I um, surprised myself and, and, and uh, agreed to run for governor of Indiana, never ever thought beyond that. I thought it would be a useful thing. I saw my state not just slipping sideways, but sinking. And uh, I thought that, uh, and a lot of us thought, that we ought to organize ourselves and go try to make the play, uh, place a, a better a state, a more prosperous state uh, for those who came after. And I, that's all I ever was set out to do was four years, maybe eight years, mm -hmm. working hard on that, and that's what I've been doing. So let me put it to you the other way around. You made some good money at Lilly. You're term limited as governor. Why wouldn't you run for president? You're confident enough, as best I you could say to yourself, you could sort of think of it in terms of offering yourself to the American people. Here are the issues you care about. Here's what you know how to do. You see the budget as a red menace. If enough folks agree with you, you'll take the job. Uh, Peter, um, two things. I mean, one is, aside from those who really just have an incredible personal obsession or passion with it, uh, um, you know, that is, it is an incredible undertaking. Um, and not just for you, but you drag your family along with you. Right. And, uh, it's a savage jungle out the way there. I hope we're going to change this eventually. It's something else I've appealed to um, folks that agree with us on most things is, you know, let the other side be the people with the hate speech. You know, you can't outdo them anyway. Uh, but for the moment, it, it is a very, very uh, uh, awful uh, uh, endeavor. and. Um, uh, not something to be done lightly, at least by someone who has always thought of public service as something that a, uh, where a citizen pays rent to this wonderful nation of ours, someone once said, um, go and uh, uh, do your service and go back to your plow. And that's what I've always intended to do, and uh, it's not, you don't just lightly toss that aside and All right. take this on. Last question, whether you run or not, here's the last question. James Glassman writing in the uh, Wall Street Journal a couple of weeks ago, quote, the relative economic standing of the United States is declining. The Congressional Budget Office estimates that U.S. growth will average little more than 2% over the next 70 years, compared to about 3.5% during the second half of the 20th century. This is a stunning decline, close <laughs> quote. Economic decline, 
Mm -hmm. If only relative decline, it's decline. The rise of China, the threat of radical Islam, Iran in pursuit of nuclear weapons, North Korea already in possession of nuclear weapons. Now, you spoke a moment ago about meeting with some college kids. What do you say, particularly to kids, but to any Americans who say, the wheels are coming off this project. Mm -hmm. The United States of America's best days are behind it. What do you say? I say the wheels are a little wobbly. Let's get the lug nuts and the wrench out and fix this thing. It is fixable. But it, is, it, it really is, you know. Um, the, we've discussed most of the main elements, most of the lug nuts we have discussed here. I personally believe they are entirely practical, and I think they are politically practical. Once Americans uh, understand the facts, uh, and in their new, I think, more sober min uh, mind mindset that you just that you just described, um, and what I would say and and, and do say is, uh, if we simply get on with this, there's no country on earth I'd trade places with. Mm. America's possibilities are tremendous, uh, unless we allow our self-inflicted uh, wounds to injure us uh, uh, too severely in the in the near term, in the next few years, when we can still deal with them. And so, you know, China, no, I wouldn't want China's problems. They, they, they have uh, uh, their demographic problems, the, the inevitable, uh, inevitable difficulty they'll have trying to maintain authoritarianism with rising uh, income standards. Um, Europe, heaven's sakes. Um, you know, the uh, Islamist societies are a profound danger and need to be watched, I think, and dealt with as a security threat, but they're not an economic threat. Uh, mm. They're going to have to change dramatically ever to uh, really rise much above where they are. So I think that um, it, it, Reagan comparisons are they're so dangerous, Reagan era uh, comparisons, but we were in a very desperate position. Some folks have forgotten how desperate uh, in the late 70s and in 1980, uh, and it did take very substantial action. But having taken that action, look how we, we had three decades of fabulous um, success and growth. And I think that that same sort of thing is possible again, but not if we dither, uh, not if we uh, uh, shrink back. Mitch Daniels, 49th governor of the great state of Indiana, now recovering from rotator cuff okay. surgery. Thank you very much. Enjoyed it. I'm Peter Robinson for Uncommon Knowledge. Thank you.